We are on episode 15 of the 52 Weeks of Reefing. This one is called Adding Saltwater Fish Intelligently and Safely. Uh, we did talk about UV sterilizers in the previous one, so they're in some ick management and ick eradication. There might be some uh, pour over into this one too, but adding saltwater fish intelligently and safely, core belief. More to this than you think, yeah. uh, actually. Yeah. So, uh, all right, so I don't know, I think probably in week 15 we said acclimate your fish or something like that. I don't know, I don't, <laughs> know. I, I don't remember exactly what we said back then, but there's a lot more to it nowadays. Core belief here, is fish adapt to most environments, mm -hmm. but are also sensitive creatures, and so they do so best when done gradually, mm. right? And this means more than just your drip application, and your drip drip uh, uh, acclimation yeah, is yeah. actually the bad way in most cases. <laughs> uh, so fish adapt to most environments, meaning mm -hmm. these things will adapt to a wide array of environments. Different salinities, different alkalinities, different pHs, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nutrient levels, water quality, yeah. all kinds of stuff. Yeah. But they're also sensitive creatures, and they do so, they, they do adapt to those environments best when it's done gradually. Okay. All right, so what matters most? First thing that matters most that we believe is that temperature and pH matter most when we're talking about acclimation. Salinity, if it's way off, uh, you know, can, can cause osmotic shock if you're going from like 1.021 or 1.022 to 1.027 or 1.026, it's pretty white. Mm -hmm. But if, uh, if I'm going from like 1.023 to 1.025, uh, less of a, dra a dramatic difference and, and probably less of a concern, but temperature and, and pH the most. So if the temperature and pH of your tank is the same as uh, what's in the bag, you probably don't even need to bother mm. with uh, like uh, drip and all this other stuff. Mm. You can put the fish in. Uh, if the temperature or pH is way off or the salinity is way off causing the osmotic shock, mm. then you know some type of acclimation is necessary. But temperature and pH matter most. Mm. Uh, next one, what we believe matters most, never use the water from the bag. Uh, a couple reasons, you know, some, some places will put, uh, that ammonia detoxifier or something in the water. Mm -hmm. Um, and, or you might have water from a system that maybe they don't, maybe they pull it from the copper, the copper treatment almost system always. and put it right in the bag and use the copper treated water. Well, now you're going to dump that in your tank. Copper and corals don't mix. So in fact, what I've been told, it's not so much that they need water, copper or water in the transport bag. It's that it's just cheaper and easier to scoop out the bag, the fish and the water at out the of same the tank time. at the same time uh, than it is to go get them a new batch of water that doesn't Th have Then copper. acclimate them to the new batch of shipping water and then ship them in the new water and yeah. send it, yeah, yeah. So the best places will do that. The best places, We'll move them from the medicated water to new salt water and put ammonia detoxifier in there uh, to not have uh, the uh, ammonia become toxic in transport. But the ammonia toxifier can't be used with copper in most cases, so you can't do that. And also, another reason that you see the copper water in that bag is because that's the primary method of water changes for big facilities. Mm, so yeah. every, copper laden water. Yeah. Well, no, I put a gallon or I put a you know half a gallon of water in the bag of the fish and take it out and I ship it out. Now today I'll have to replace a half a gallon of water for in, that fish. Yeah. So the primary way to keep water clean is actually pulling system water out. Yeah. Uh, if they didn't do that, then they would have to go create more salt water. And then, so yeah, yeah. So never use the water from the bag. The bag could have disease in it. Mm. The bag could have, oh, most cases is going to have some kind of medication Treatment, in yeah. it. Uh, so, you know, never ever, just don't bother even asking. Just don't use water in the bag. <laughs> uh, we also believe matters most is that uh, consider an in-tank acclimation box, uh, pain in the corner. Uh, I think that pain in the corner is from Elliot, mm -hmm. is of Elliot's approach. So, uh, the acclimation box, I mean, you have, you have acclimation pre-made ones. eShops has, a, has some, a bunch of, uh, there's a few other brands out there that have some. And you can get varying sizes and things like that. You took it a different path and you actually just took some acrylic and made your own, which was the height of the tank. Uh, it allowed you for to put some aquascape in there. 
uh, and things, but uh, also allowed for a little more swimming room for the acclimation box. Uh, Elliot was telling us what he does is he'll take a, a sheet of acrylic and just section off like a quarter side of the tank. So he'll put the new fish edition on on one side uh, in the small little chamber and the, for about a week or so, I think he said a week or two, then he'll take a, a fish that he might be aggressive or he's worried about, flip flop the new edition in the, uh, in the existing one. So now the, the old guy that's been living on the block for a long time is quarantined in this little corner, uh, corridor section while the other one gets the free roam and then remove the acrylic paint and allow them to, uh, to be together. Probably the easiest way to do that is just get an acrylic paint that goes into the corner, creates like a little triangle yeah. essentially. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, maybe you could use your magnet LG holder to hold it in place or yeah. something. But uh, for me, I just went to Home Depot and chopped up some acrylic. I don't even think you need a saw. I think you could just use a like a score, score it, and crack snap it. it, and then use it, super glue. The stuff doesn't have to be leak free. It's sitting in water, so it doesn't matter if there's a little gap or something here. Yeah, I don't even need fancy thin stuff. Will be just fine mm -hmm. as well. Uh, and so the reason I did it is I put some pretty expensive fish in there that were really, really tiny, and I just didn't want them to get bothered or eaten. And here's the deal is when, once I put them in there and I let them live inside that thing for, you know, in some cases it was like more than a month mm. uh, until they got bigger. Uh, then when I removed it, like the other fish couldn't like care less about those two fish. Right. Like they were old news. They were all companions. For yeah. A long time. You guys have been here forever. <laughs> yeah. And so... Uh, at building a little box for them. The problem with some of those uh, acclimation box that you can buy is A, they're magnets. So if anybody bumps one of those magnets, now they're free. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. They're also kind of small in many cases. But yeah. like if I had a, you know, if I wanted to add another tang to the tank, if my options were build a special box, cord it off in the corner, or just throw it in. Uh, I would even use one of the little eShop ones and let, at least let them live in there for a day or two while everybody kind of got used to each other so there wasn't this immediate mm. uh, time bomb. Yeah. Uh, but like building your own box, maybe the best thing because you can actually house them in there, but the cording them off. The part that Elliot surprised me with was, of course you would cordon off the new one. It's really easy to put the new fish in there. Yeah. But the fact that he would swap them out and try to catch the others like so if i put a yellow tang in but i also had a purple tang already in there then try to swap it out and get cordon the purple tang in there for a week while the yellow tang now it's gets a free the roam free roam yeah like oh that's pretty smart man yeah and actually if you use those big sheets of plastic you, you can, can actually catch kind of, you can core you can catch them pretty quick yeah corral them corral them into mm -hmm. there like if you put it kind of out and drop food into there then you just kind of close it off yeah 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 yep. Uh, so yeah, consider like a big acclimation box uh, if you're, it's, especially if you're going to add things you don't think is going to go well. Yeah, uh, Tang's being well, probably one of the biggest culprits there. I, I would do that. I I enjoyed the project actually, yeah. and then I built even a little mini aquascape to put in. <laughs> I, I thought the project was fun. Uh, we also believe matters most is that an acclimation box can damage the fish. You think about those uh, acclimation boxes that just have a like Swiss cheese drilled holes in there. You know the painstaking process it would take to go through and soften every single edge around every single circle inside of that box all on all sides. Uh, so Elliot was telling us, he goes, a lot of those boxes, you know, they flash up against them or they're reaching for food and then, you know, get their lips inside of some of those holes, can get themselves cut up and scarred up and stuff. He says, uh, you know, they can actually uh, harm the fish or damage the fish. Yeah, so all the little sharp edges mm. uh, on the holes in the acclimation box, as the, one of them's trying to get out or one of them's trying to get in, it can damage their face, it can damage their eyes and give them infections. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that I, I don't think is that big of a deal is if you just took like a piece of sandpaper and rounded off the edges a little bit, mm. but any care you could get to make sure they're not sharp edges in there. I also killed a purple tang this way, which is I had a acclimation box that I had built yeah. and for whatever reason like it came away from the glass a little bit and opened up like maybe a three eighths inch sliver and the tried course, to go through yeah of course the purple tang wedged himself in there and it literally happened while I was talking to Elliot I was on the phone talking to him about uh, some other stuff with the fish and then when I looked around he just turned around and said F <laughs> you know? yeah I mean like I saw him wedged in there mm. and he was already like 
you know, it was only a matter of minutes. Yeah, man. yeah. Uh, and uh, he ultimately died because of that. So, you know, you got to be careful about those things. The acclimation box needs to be safe for the fish as well. So uh, consider all the ways that that could go wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, what matters most is uh, if you're going to do more fish at once, more is often best. Uh, one is just a target. Oh, yeah. So if you're going to add, like, a, say I got a purple tang and I want to add a yellow tang uh, uh, and uh, like a bunch of other things in there or a whole school of tangs or something, uh, often adding three in at once will actually reduce the aggression because they won't really, it'll kind of, the aggression kind of gets split up amongst everyone. Don't know, don't know which one to attack. There's three of them now. Three brand new strangers. Uh, so the chances that one is just going to get picked on uh, three times is less. It's like, think about like a sheepdog and a single rogue sheep. Yeah. Well, that's going to get 100% of the attention by the <laughs> If you let six sheep go, they're all going to get a, just a little enough uh, <laughs> attention to know who's boss here, but nobody's going to get totally picked <laughs> on, right? Yeah. So, yeah, uh, I, I, it goes kind of like you, you wouldn't think more is better in many cases, but uh, I found this to be true with a lot of things. If you got two of something, they often like will pick on each other. Mm. If you have eight of something, they don't care about each other. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, you know, it, it depends on the thing you're talking about, but in most cases, and if you're going to disperse, and it doesn't actually have to be three yellow tanks. You could add a ras, a yellow tang, and some other things in there all at once. And it won't be as good, yeah. but it'll be better than if you uh, added it all by I've itself. seen six-line wrasses go after every, all types of species of fish. doesn't matter what they are, if it looked the same or not. A lot of times you'll see, like, a zebra soma tang will go after a zebra soma and, uh, you know, an acanthus will go after an acanthus and what have you. But, uh, you know, when it comes to like the little wrasses or the mean, mean little guys in the, in the world, the orchid dottie backs are one that were always mean for me too. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So adding like, oh, if I want to add a clownfish, add two uh, instead of just one or what have you. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Next one. Um, stocking list or plan and pick an order it matters most like come up with a stocking list or plan to stock and then uh pick an order in which they go in and a lot of times this is like the aggression based and like the territorial based thing and i don't it's kind of one of those like reef safe with caution uh, some people might say like uh, you should add in uh, your clownfish maybe last or because they can get aggressive once they they establish their territory uh, towards any other fish that gets in. But uh, I I made a stocking list for based off of those recommendations online of uh, you know reef safe, reef safe with caution, and all this, and then pick the the ones that still fit the bill that would fit in my tank. Uh, but never gave I didn't give any thought as to all right which which one should go in first. Mm -hmm. So there is definitely a pattern of of uh, that of what and it's all going to depend on your fish. There's no real rules of thumb per se on a lot of stuff other than some of these things are at odds with each other. So I like to add the tangs at first so they eat all the algae. Yeah, utilitarian. It, it may not be the best path. So I would you know reach out in many cases to the place that you're buying the fish from. Say, hey, this is the list of fish I'm thinking about. What order do you think I should add them in? Mm -hmm. And it might be a good way to find out whether or not you're buying it from somebody or anywhere good if they care at all. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I will tell you, I this was a rule that I learned on my first tank, I, and I, I I was told this: build a stocking plan. You can only sit so many fish in there, so think about the ones you really care about and get them up front uh, and get the list. So I built out the list, and you know, it's funny. I took it too literal. I ordered actually from Marine Depot Live. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, there was a live version of their site a long time ago. Uh, instead of sending me a Randall's Gobi, they sent me a Rainford's Gobi. Uh. That wasn't on my list. So I took it to the fish store and said, hey, uh, we, we got to take this. I don't want it in my tank. And they looked at me like I was high. <laughs> Why wouldn't you? I mean, because it, it, for those of you who don't know, Rainford's Gobi is just a tiny little Gobi that eats filamentous you know, algae and yeah. would, would have just been fine with it. <laughs> There was no reason it could have not also been in this edition. And it's also a cool fish. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I took it literal. Like, I'm going to stick to my plan. And yeah. To the point where I went and, like, released it back <laughs> to the fish store. Uh, and they gave me a tiny credit for it. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I would have a, a plan of where you're going. And if you have a plan where you're going, you'll probably get there better than if you mm. don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next one. Uh, we believe matters most. I think the second part doesn't apply here. But, uh uh, shut the lights off. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, is 
there's a lot of light happening back here. And if we were to add a new fish into this tank, it's like a, it's a, it's like a new character in the play coming into the scene and covered in light and spotlight poof, hit, hits them. Cool. Uh, that means uh, insta target uh, for a lot of a lot of them. So you can shut the lights off and uh, let them sort it out. So I asked Elliot this one. I was like, "Do you think it's wise to turn tell people to turn the lights off? You know, when they're going to add fish? Something that I've always been told. You mm -hmm. know, it decreases uh, aggression, kind of causes everybody to kind of go to their homes and stuff." Uh, and he said, eh, if you get it from the fish store and you're going to bring it home and let it go inside of an hour, maybe. But if it's been thrown around in a FedEx truck for the last uh, 24 yeah. hours and uh, it's been jostled and it's in kind of toxic water and it's stressed out to all hell. Uh, absolutely. Shut the lights off. Shut the lights <laughs> off. Uh, and Give it some rest. You got, it wants some rest and it's much time to, to manage that as humanly possible. Mm. So shut off the lights ah, okay. uh, when you add the fish. Also, turn off high powered pumps uh, is also something that matters a lot when you're adding a fish. So like just an immense amount of turbulence is not good for a fish that's really stressed out and doesn't know where to go and doesn't where, know where the safe spots are mm -hmm. and may not know how dangerous your Vortec or uh, Toons pump or whatever really is. I've had this happen uh, now thinking back multiple times, adding a fish, not doing anything about the pumps. And, you know, hours later, they're sucked up against the Vortec. Stuck, stuck like, to the pump, yeah. You know, I, obviously didn't know that that was a place that you don't want to be. They've probably never been exposed to that type of environment before where if I come around here, the flow hitting me is a little less, so it feels a little safer. And the next thing you know, it's like a magnet. It just sucks them right in. You know, people will say they're fish killers. I will say they're a stressed fish that was probably largely kind of floating around anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. a lot of times, like a healthy fish would be able to swim out from that under their own power. Yeah. So turn off the high-powered pumps. The other part that will do is it will kind of throw off the other tank inhabitants, like mm. what's going on here. And yeah. Like it just changes things up in a way that causes them to not go after the other fish quite yeah. as much in many cases. Mm. Uh, uh, another one is uh i mean these are all like a designed to be 80 20 rules here like not nothing is 100 percent. you're just increasing the odds and successes uh chances of success but right. well-fed fish uh may be less likely to fight uh, over food or any other aggression hmm. hungry things tend to be more irritable <laughs> uh, I, I think that's probably uh, that's true. that uh, <laughs> snickers uh hangry type uh, oh, yes. yeah all those commercials same thing with fish <laughs> yeah, so well-fed fish are less likely to fight, so uh, now is not time to starve them. Well, no, I mean, you could even take that to the next uh, to the next level. In when you're introducing a fish, feed just before or right. I mean, a lot of people want to see that the fish are eating anyway, so you can save a feeding for when the fish first hits the uh, hits the tank. And now there's an abundance of food, so everybody's kind of focused on the food floating around. Maybe it's uh, get an extra algae clip or two extra algae clips and put them on different areas of the glass so that I'm distracting my tang that is Feel, I already know he's going to go inspect the new addition and maybe attack it if it's another tang. Uh, how about I distract you with uh, algae over there or algae over here and mm -hmm. uh, start eating and I'm less likely to look over at the other guy and get mad at him. Fighting over food is a common behavior for all organisms on the planet. Uh, all right, another one, uh, what matters most is plan to watch the tank for an hour or so, only looking for cat catastrophes, odd behavior is normal. So when you put the fish in, you know, spend the next hour, I mean, play some Candy Crush or whatever you gotta do, <laughs> stare at the thing, and just make sure that nothing is absolutely terrible going on. And like, yes, there will be some aggression. You don't go in there and try to, uh, to fight it up. They're gonna have to figure this out unless one's literally ripping the other one's fins off. Uh, and making sure that it's not getting stuck to pumps, making sure that uh, nothing terrible is happening. Aware, be aware though that like they may not eat for days, and mm. it, there's it's not great, but it's also not bad. And then the the bad part is usually what happens is if like oh my god he hasn't eaten two days, let's capture him, let's move him to another tank, let's do this other thing, yeah, yeah. and you're actually just making the stressing, worse, stressing, you know? stressing, stressing. Yeah, yeah. Elliot said uh, he we had him on the phone. We were talking about this one, and he said. Uh, 
Uh, if I had it my way, uh, I'd tell people or I'd have people put the fish in the tank and then come back in two or in a few hours. Don't in even look days. at it. Two days. Yeah. Uh, come back in two days and see what happened. Don't even look at it. Because <laughs> so the natural instinct is for you to uh, disrupt, uh, if they're not getting along all hunky-dory, is to uh, disrupt them and stress them out even further and even further. And eventually they just they succumb to stress. You know, it's interesting. It's like when he said that, it's like, I just leave it for two days and don't look at it. I'm like, oh, that's the exact opposite of our watch it for an hour. Or something. <laughs> uh, and I'm like, that's so interesting. But after I processed this statement, I'm like, you know what? Mm. For the average reefer, like that's listening to this advice, not like pro level, level reefer who's done this a hundred times. Yeah. Uh, the average reefer, the chances of you misreading stress and trying to do something about it uh and doing something worse than just if you hadn't looked at it mm. is actually pretty high yeah that's yeah. why you that's why you uh, condone it so i can actually understand where he's coming from on that but i do think uh, on the flip side watching not for odd behavior but for catastrophe mm. like l this one's literally going to kill the next one in, in the next couple of minutes yeah if I don't do something about it well when you get to that point that leads to the next thing we believe matters most when you get to that point if, if you do see like this one's going to die in the next couple of minutes if i don't do anything uh, a lot of times, stressed fish will just swim right into your head. I haven't caught a fish that just swam right in, but uh, they could be so stressed that this safe haven, they're so easy to catch, maybe they swim right in. I have found, like, once, uh, I, I actually did the, an interesting thing. Like, I wanted a purple tank in a tank where I had a yellow tank, right? Mm. This was my first tank. And so I listened to all the rules, and I took the uh, uh, yellow tang uh, out of the tank. I put it down the frag systems down in the basement, put the purple tang in. He was obviously doing just fine. Uh, like months later, I added the yellow tang back to the tank, and boom, man, he just went after the purple tang and attacked the crap out of him. He knew, <laughs> he knew his home, man. And he tore him up. And I'm like, oh my God, I gotta get him out of there. I put the net in and the purple tank swam right into the net and I scooped him up. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, I've never seen, I thought this was gonna be a giant pain in the butt. <laughs> okay, so the nature of it, you may not get that lucky, mm. but that stressed out fish isn't as good at hiding in many yeah. cases. They're yeah. weaker, they're not really uh, as aware uh, of their surroundings. And you might actually be able to catch them with your hand better than the uh. net. So I will say, okay, I retract my statement. I have experienced this, and it was on the 160 when we put a six line ras. Okay, so after we ran into Monty eating Nudibronx, we put a six line in there. Mm -hmm. That six line started to go and beat up your diamond or your uh, your gobies, mm -hmm. and you eventually you know killed them. The two the twin spots. Uh, I caught the twin spots because they were up here floating on the surface, uh, avoiding being anywhere near where that six line could just bombard them and you know, uh, surprise them. So they were just floating up here, and I, I did. I literally walked up to the tank, and I just went like this and scooped them right up. They were there and put them back in the sump. So but. often a, a stressed fish is a lot easier to catch mm. than a super healthy fish. Uh, also, sometimes. sometimes this works, especially uh, the first couple times you do it. Uh, red light. So in theory, a lot of these fish can't see red light. Their eyes aren't accustomed to it because red doesn't really penetrate uh, seawater very well. Mm. Um, so they haven't evolved the need to see red light. No. Uh, so if you use your LEDs and only turn on just the L red LEDs and probably the dimmer, the better. Yeah, because I think uh, they'll eventually, I think our experience here on the 160, they, we had the reds up so high that it was kind of a wash at the end. See. But you have to black out the whole room, like do this at night. Yeah. You can actually catch some fish in red light because you can see them, but they can't see you. However, they will start to feel that what, pressure of your net, of the net, yeah. so when it feels mm -hmm. like when it's coming after them. So They'll you don't dart. get many attention uh, shots at this. <laughs> you might want to try with your hand first, but if you're having problems catching a stressed fish, uh, you might want to try the red LEDs. Only turn those on. Surprise! It will probably depend on the spectrum, yeah. like. You know, like the radions are more red, whereas the Kessel one's a little bit more orangey. Mm -hmm. You know, it'll, it'll depend on, on the specific fish, their eyeballs, yeah. uh, and their ability to sense the net as well. Yeah, darken out the room and let <laughs> it stay dark for a little while. Prep your lights and your thing and just be ready to go so that way when you flip the reds on, uh, you're quick to act. It kind of paralyzes them too. Yeah. So if it's pitch black in the room, like literally no light, and you just turn the reds on all of a sudden, and like, they will sense what? something uh, went on, uh, and they just kind of like freeze for a second, gives you Give a you chance to huh. be quick. 
Uh, uh, we also believe matters most is alternating isolation. That goes back to that uh, uh, that approach by um, uh, Elliot in you know your fish that are already in the tank and have been in the tank. You introduce somebody new in the acclimation box, and uh, when you're ready to kind of give them a swap, take that one established one that's already in there, scoop him out, put the new one in, and then put the old one in the acclimation box, kind of give him a timeout. But uh, you're shifting like that. Uh, I can imagine like you, the established fish just isn't used to it. He's so cut in, into his territory. I know all the places to go. I know where to hide. I know where to ambush this new guy. And then you have me locked up in a box while I get to sit here and watch this dude uh, trounce on my territory. <laughs> so, yep. uh, so in the spirit of uh, also high percentage pass, but not perfect, is if you're going to add two fish that you know full well are going to fight with each other being like two Similar yellow tanks. Fish, yeah. Bigger than the existing fish will probably have the highest success rate. Yeah, that little guy right? is less likely to pick on a big heavy guy. Yeah, so like uh, if the new yellow tank you add is 50% bigger than the old one, it's going to have a higher success rate than other options. Mm. And like note that every one of these fish have a personality and so you'll never get the end all answer to this. It's just, if you had to pick one bigger is a, than the existing one is a higher percentage path. Antithesis of that same size is one of the lowest success rates. The lowest possible success rate is if you got one that's the exact same size. I mean, you're right? almost talking immediately fight. The, like the, the, the theory here is that you don't go pick on something bigger than you know because you know you're gonna lose. If you go pick on something that's your act same size, mm -hmm. you may think you're going to win either one of these things. Yeah. So then the, the middle of this is you can also have success by picking something that is the smallest, mm -hmm. like being it's half the size of the little existing tiny one. Guy. Uh, and that's better than same size, but not as, as good as bigger. Uh, and just the reason for it is it's the smaller one is obviously just more fragile. Yeah. So if it does get picked on, it's not going to be able to handle it as mm. well. Uh, all right. Hard lessons in all of this adding uh, of adding fish. saltwater fish intelligently and safely. First one. Uh, hard. First hard lesson is slow drip acclimations and temperature oxygen levels. Yeah. So <clears throat> a lot of people, you know, slower and patience is like part of drilled into the mentality of reefing. But some of this stuff isn't wise. Like, like too slow. <clears throat> like yeah. Six hours of a drip of an IV drip into a bucket. Yeah, so if I drip six hours in there, the chemistry will turn over very slow, but like the reality is it's too slow to actually heat the water too. So I'm maintaining room temperature water now in this thing. <laughs> uh, also, there is a low amount of oxygen that's coming through this thing. Mm. Uh, I, so in most cases, I wouldn't like take a six hour drip. I, I would, you know, Follow probably the acclimation that comes in the box uh, because they might have something specific to you. But in general, I try to turn over the water in an hour. Yeah. You know, I'm going to try to turn most of that water over fairly quickly. If I turn it over fairly quickly, A, the temperature from the water will help hold the temperature in the bag. Uh, but I mean, I might even do it as close as a half hour. Mm. I just try to like not shock it totally by just throwing it in a completely different environment. But there's a lot of different things that slow acclimation can actually harm. So uh, yeah, we'll hit on a couple of them. So, but the next hard lesson here is float the bag and dump might be the best if the parameters are similar. We said yeah. that earlier. Yeah, the pH well, up here at the top where, where what we believe most is that temperature and pH matter most and salinity if it's way off. Well, if you've got your temperature set because you floated the bag, uh, temp and got the temperature right. And pH is the you know is similar in your tank water and versus the bag, uh, and salinity is on point. Then your best bet is probably to just hand scoop the fish out, put them in the tank, ready to go, or acclimation box. That'd be the least stressful if yeah. kept the parameters match. Hmm. Uh, one of the things we talked about earlier too in the ammonia thing uh, in a different episode was ammonia in the bag. Uh, and ammonia blockers often don't mix in system as water and copper. So one of the things about what can happen is 
when you ship that bag, especially this isn't as much from like from a fish store, but if you had it shipped overnight via you know FedEx or UPS, yeah, the thing will come, and what will happen is it actually will have respirated a lot, meaning there's a bunch of CO2 extra in their water. The pH is low. They will have uh, ammonia in there because the copper prevented them from adding the ammonia blocker in many cases. Mm. And so what will happen now is the low pH, all the ammonia in there is actually ammonium yeah. and not toxic. However, <clears throat> if you open the bag up and you start Oxygen. putting uh, new fresh water in there and, or new water from your tank in there, all of a Higher sudden pH. the pH goes mm -hmm. up, the ammonium turns into ammonia gas and super toxic to the fish. So like in that case, if I'm letting it gas off over the course of the next five hours as I'm super slow drip acclimating, I might be actually harming the fish. Just breathing toxic. Yeah. Mm. Part of the reason why you want to turn over uh, a little faster than like, I think some of the acclimation of doing this like, over six hours or some, you know, long prolonged thing is because it feels good to say that it isn't necessarily the best. You ease them into it, yeah. It just uh, sounds good. And plausible theory and reefing is as good as fact. <laughs> a hard lesson, again, is assuming that aggression won't happen to you. Uh, aggression, in, interspecies uh, aggression happens. Uh, you know, different species aggression happens. I, I said the six line here, you know, in the 160 attacked uh, quite a few different fish. Um, mm -hmm. But aggression, uh, if you assume aggression won't happen to you, uh, it's a hard lesson to learn. We already learned it. Uh, another one is consider habitat and make changes. Uh, and so if you're looking in there and things don't look like they're going well, look around and say, do I have I really built yeah. enough habitat for these things? And if they haven't, you can always add some more rock. Yeah. You know, you can build those little structures that we talked about in the aquascape stuff and just glue a bunch of little pebbles together, essentially, with a bunch of holes in it and put it in. Uh, some of the fish will move right in. Uh, and so don't think that you're stuck with the aquascape or the habitat you've already created because you can always add more and, uh, you know, add safety to the fish. Mm. All right. Hard lesson. A lot of problems are not diagnosable. You just got to do your best. Uh, you can't plan for everything and whether your six chromies are going to work their way down to one or adding uh, another clownfish when there's a pair in there or tangs, especially. Um, you, you just can't you can't predict for all of them uh, and even if you did some of those acclimation boxes or you did the uh, the separation all you're doing i mean you're not guaranteeing that none of these problems will happen to fish aggression and all this will happen it's just increasing your chances of success that they don't i mean i can't diagnose a whole fish I can't. You know, like if i have one of those i can't diagnose that problem in many cases you just do the best we can uh, and if you follow a bunch of the things that we have here, uh, I think that you'll be higher like path. light years uh, in terms of higher success rate path than uh, uh, most of the people who are just kind of winging it. Whole point of the series. All right. So what's next? 